Attention all neurodivergents. Are you tired of feeling overwhelmed by loud noises and crowded environments? Well, D-Buds are a first of their kind game-changing earplugs with volume adjustable technology. D-Bud earplugs can help reduce sensory overload, help you focus and make your environment a lot more manageable. I've been using D-Buds the past few months now and they've really been amazing out and about at the gym and pretty much any time I'm not listening to music. If you're interested in giving them a go, my affiliate link is always down in the description. Use code 40 40 for a 20% discount. Good day and welcome back to the 40 40 podcast with your host as always, Mr. Thomas Headley. How are you guys doing today? The hustle and bustle of life, things are getting very overwhelming for me at the moment, and it's very apt for the conversation that we're going to be having today because we are talking about autistic burnout, how to avoid it, how to spot it, um, some of the uh, more more personal experiences that myself and my guests will have um, to give a bit of, bit of background, a bit more of a personal angle to, to the experience so that hopefully you'll be able to relate to it in some ways and implement some of the things that we have in our own lives for your own benefit. So I think it's a good idea to first introduce my guest, Vera. How are you doing today? I'm very well, Thomas. Thank you for having me. Well, it's um, I know that from having our, our chats before, uh, you said that you, you've listened to the podcast um, a fair bit. Like um, how... What what has been like your your favorite episode so far? Well, uh, some of the ones about self advocacy really spoke to me, and definitely inspired a lot of my own attitude to how I do things. I'm I'm very keen on those. But I was also mentioned to you some of the recent ones about adapting your environment to your sensory needs, and that's yeah. something that I'm very interested in, and something that I'm doing currently in my own house. I remember the self advocacy one because it was, um, I think, the one the one with autistic Callum, and they're they're really interesting because they, I think they do they're kind of in the world of like law and and things like that, so they have to be like really overly specific with their language. So like when they moved to social media and started off with like Twitter and budding up an Instagram page, a lot of that a lot of that transferred into how they. Um, did their posts and did their did their tweets and things like that. I can really see that because it's very like comprehensive. Anything that I've seen from 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 them on Instagram, so might be good to uh, learn a bit more about you. Would you like to um, tell us a little bit about what you do in terms of your work as the happy autistic lady? Love that name. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'm Vera. I started my Happy Autistic Lady illustrations on Instagram shortly after I was diagnosed autistic a few years ago, I think three or four now. Wow. So not not too recent, not too far away. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to connect with other people in the actually autistic community and to really learn to embrace my neurodivergence. It was something that I had not encountered autism before. I'm from the Czech Republic. We don't don't have any of that I mean we obviously very much do it's just not spoken about and I really wanted to come to it with a positive attitude hence the happy autistic lady whereabouts is the uh, Czech Republic because I have heard about it mostly through like I remember there was these activities that we did um, around like the world cup um, where like all the students in the class had to like pick a team and stuff like that and Czech Republic was part of that. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a cool one. I'll go for that one. It's a fantastic (laughs) country. Uh, It's underneath Germany and Poland. And we speak Czech. Uh, We've got about 10 million people. And I was born here in the UK, but I've lived my life half and half, which explains my name. I've got a Czech name, but then my accent is quite English. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And is that that more more or less the kind of... Because I, I know that for a lot of um, English kids, English autistic kids, when they grow up, they listen to a lot of like American based shows. And so they, they start picking up on like the accents and stuff. Is that something that you yes. experienced with? Definitely. My accent goes all over the place and it depends <laughs> on who I'm working with. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually, I, I, it's, a, it's a kind of a weird thing because, like, it's not something that I do consciously. It's very much like my, my like, behavior and speaking style seems to very much match the person that I'm talking to. Um, yeah. It's very strange sometimes. But what about, because um, you said that you, you, you were diagnosed, like, three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. What was um, kind of, the, like, the situation around that? Like, what, why did you go for it? Yeah, I was diagnosed at university because of mental health. And I realised that it, there was something more there. It wasn't just depression. And it was actually because of autistic burnout. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I was exploring at university and through my Happy Autistic Lady illustrations was how do I deal with my own energy? How do I stop? overexerting myself and how can I work with my own needs with my sensory needs with my energy needs my social needs everything so that I can work with myself not against myself and that's where happy autistic lady came in because I wanted to really embrace being myself and being happy in this sort of neurotypical world so since Mm -hmm. since starting those illustrations I've actively pursued autism advocacy with lots of different organizations including on the UK um, charity Ambush About Autism. They've got a youth council. Yes, I remember you saying. So I'll t- I'll mention one or two of their resources, and then currently I work for the UK Civil Service in environmental mm-hmm. IT, and I do a few hours every week with our autism and ADHD network. But I still mainly I still mainly do just happy or to sit lady with myself and my sister, and we just have a great time. Uh, we do lots of illustrations online but we also do empowering neuropositive stationery and stickers we've got a great community there so so what was it like because for me it's it's very much been the case that I'm very good at sort of independent work like things that I can get on by myself being being creative and you know um organizing things for myself but one area that i really struggle with is stuff around organization and comms that's something that i just never have been able to get around so i I know that you were mentioning something about like the autism adhd network do you have a lot of oversight of like Mm. tying things together i actually am the comms and engagement lead (laughs) (laughs) and through my work on comms and engagement there i moved into my current role doing comms and engagement for this big environmental IT program, which is really funny because a few years ago, if you told me I was semi-extroverted and dealing with communication and getting your message across, I would have been absolutely shocked. I was (laughs) mostly non-verbal, had massive stutters and speech impediments and didn't, didn't like talking to people very much. But the journey through that was because I've learned how to do communication I've learned how to look at things from other people's perspective and really consider audience Mm. timings planning I've almost overcompensated to the point that it's now natural to me and I've got so many different spreadsheet formats (laughs) list formats it's uh it's very helpful but but with happy autistic lady having my sister on board has really made things easier in that we share the load of comms And it's just nice to talk to other people about things that are interesting and not have the burden of responsibility. That's probably mm. what drives me most is in, in working with other people is that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with other people. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, it would be uh, really cool to know about like the work that you've done with Ambitious about autism because I have had some comms with them. I think I, I think I've worked with them a couple couple of times. Um, why is it that you you gravitate towards that organisation sort of as opposed to other ones? I actually found them through their employability programs for young autistic people. They were doing a civil service internship. And this was at a point where I'd just been diagnosed. I didn't know any autistic people. I mean, it turns out I did, retrospectively. They just weren't open about it. They just didn't know. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> and it, it, I, I was being quite loud about it, loud and proud. Uh, and it just took a few months for people to come out of the woodworks, if you'll excuse yeah. me, Adeem. Yeah. And I applied for this internship. I got it. But then the COVID happened, so it, it couldn't go ahead. If one door closes, another one opens. I was able to join their youth network. And we do every Tuesday and Thursday, we do really awesome peer support sessions where we just do art or listen to our favourite comedy videos and just have a great time. And together we, we, we learn about each other, share our special interests. And with the Youth Council, we're able to focus a little bit more on policy, contributing yeah. to various government papers, looking at resources, one of which I'll mention later, it's the Know Your Normal resource. Mm -hmm. And during COVID, we actually did a big series about autistic people's mental health for mental health. Like a video providers. series. We've got a video series. We're going to be doing a new one soon. Cool. This was during lockdown, we did a series with mind where we had a few thousand mental health professionals come and learn about autism and our experiences in the mental health industry um basically any autism through our own words and how they can adapt their practices to to our needs yeah i think um that sounds all, all really interesting and great and it sounds like you're you know, both having sort of a, an impact and a voice out in the autistic community, but also going and doing some like um, more direct work for for improving things for autistic people, which I think is very un under underrated at the moment. Because you know, you, you mentioned about mental health services. Like, I, I I've hardly ever found any positive um, experiences of autistic people with mental health and, and getting support for it and sort of recovering from things. So it's yeah. definitely an area that I think needs a lot of work. Um, Absolutely. And it was really powerful to come together and discuss that and sort of validate each other's experiences, but equally share with the professionals our positive experiences. Yeah. Positive stories of when somebody had stepped up and taken time to understand our sensory needs. Or when yeah. they sort of had a thought of, hey, maybe this cognitive behavioral therapy isn't working for you. For obvious reasons, your pain is <laughs> completely, you can't, you can't rationalize pain. Um, so let's try something else. And and, and all, putting all of that together into this this amazing resource funded by Mind as well, which was really That's lovely. Really cool. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Well, I suppose in a, in a similar vein to mental health, you know, today we are talking about autistic burnout. Um, and I think it's something that that I think most most lay people, most neurotypicals will know about in terms of just general burnout at work and with life, you know, those kind of social experiences, those life situations to do with like finances and the workplace. It seems to be that a lot of people experience that sort of burnout experience, but for autistic people, it's obviously going to look a lot different. There's going to be some things that perhaps are a little bit different for us um, in terms of the way that it happens and how we cope with it. So I think it would be good to start off with, you know, what what is an autistic burnout and what can it look like in, in daily life? Sure. I'll explain maybe what burnout is and then how personally I would... That sounds good. Define that sounds good. The autistic side of things. Burnout is subtle. It's long term and it's really, really debilitating. It is classed as a psychological condition. And generally it's people feel exhausted. They feel cynical and really ineffective. Like any kind of um, any amount of energy that you put into something, it's just not having the same results as it usually would. Yeah. There's one book which I have found enormously helpful, and I'll just reference it briefly. It's the book called How to Calm Your Mind by Chris Bailey. Mm. I picked it up once by complete chance, and it was super, super helpful. So I'm mentioning it that now because in it, the author mentions the six triggers of burnout. So there's six of them. It's workload. If you've got too much yeah. work to do, you're mm -hmm. going to struggle. A lack of control, 
about that workload, but also maybe not just what the contents of the work is, but when you can do it. If you're working shifts, for example, and you're a morning person, but your shifts have been assigned to you into the evening, that's going to be a source of tension. The opposite in my case. Are you an evening person? <laughs> I am. I am a. I have a solid night owl. There's just no getting away from it. I've been through stints of going like long times with uh, waking up in the morning, but I just it just never no. works for me. Do you know it's, it's genetic? Thing. Yeah, like yeah, the um, chronotypes and stuff. Yes. So your chronotype mm -hmm. preference is genetic, and this just comes to my message of work with yourself, not against yourself. There's so much messaging out there for oh, be a morning person four steps to become a morning person wake up at five and go to the gym <laughs> no that's it always it always just just blows my mind that kind of thing because it's not like getting up any earlier is going to give you more time in the day no because if, if you're an evening person you know that person who might be oh i feel so great about getting up and getting a workout in at the start of the day like <laughs> <laughs> like I, yourself maybe i'm holding my hands up now i am a morning person regrettably <laughs> my body wakes me up at six i can't do anything about it but but imagine me a switch <laughs> yeah imagine it turned around where somebody was telling me oh vera this is what you need to be an evening person have you tried yeah, waking working up in later? the nightclubs <laughs> no 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 you're being a bartender oh my god i'd be yes. a horrible bartender it's it's interesting. I think that that dynamic though, because I, I think at the moment there's so much of that like work culture whereby you know people are like glorifying these these perfect schedules and like working loads. And one of the aspects is always about getting up in the morning and and doing that kind of thing. And I just think because you know, as I said, there's not there's the exact same amount of time that you would get if you woke up later and went to sleep later, like. Why can't you be the person who goes to sleep later and goes to the gym, you know, just in the um, afternoon or something? Like, it, it doesn't make much sense to me. It feels uh, feels very strange sometimes no. watching stuff like that. That ties into another one of the six triggers. So it's the workload, lack of control. Another one is mm -hmm. fairness. Mm. If you're constantly being assaulted by a barrage of unfairness, especially as autistic people, we're very very aware of things being maybe not the way they should be or somebody saying one thing and doing another so that unfairness can have a big big impact yeah the other ones are insufficient reward so if you're not being paid adequately but socially as well if your team aren't acknowledging the work you do you are going to struggle it, you might not have a team, so you are a fr freelancer mainly, right? So socially, you, you want to be able to see that kind of reward. Yeah, it it sounds like a lot of these points that you're bringing up are very much like pretty much core to to being a content creator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like <laughs> little rewards, you know, you've got to work a lot. You don't see much success in the short term, and no. it's a very long process. No. <laughs> seeing those outcomes is a big part of the insufficient reward it's definitely something that i feel i've recently changed jobs and i'm really really enjoying my new job but you don't see Goodness. the work that you're doing immediately yeah. and that's absolutely normal it's just part of life so i need to do other things where i can see my rewards uh, my, my outcomes basically instantaneously whether that's making making an illustration or doing a bit of gardening yeah I'd say say for me that's probably going going to the gym and getting all pumped up with blood from from workouts. <laughs> that's yeah. my instantaneous reward of the day. <laughs> yeah. Do you measure how you're improving? Do you race against yourself? Oh, I I I don't like. Um, I know there's some people who go and like like measure themselves and do like body fat tests and stuff like that, but um, I think for me it's mostly just you know if I can add like one more repetition of a uh, movement every every week that i go i'm like cool yeah um sometimes works but then like if i drop by one or it's the same i'll be like oh my god everything life is is so hard on me and it, it has such a massive impact on my day 
<laughs> yeah, it's, how we measure that success is something that I'm going would definitely like to talk about towards the end. Mm. Um, it, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What's the last thing? The last things are lack of community, which we've sort of touched upon already, and our values. Big thing. Yeah. Big thing at the moment. Um, with the atomization of people, you know, everyone, community community groups sort of in, in your physical area are very, very much dwindling, especially for like the younger generation. Mm. Um, I think that's a big, big contributor. Yes. You know, yeah. You, you say a lot online of a lot of uh, people being very sort of insular and, and well, I suppose fairly like myself, except that I do go out to the gym. So it's, I get, I get a little bit of exposure to the outside world, but I do hear a lot from people that like agoraphobia and not being able to go outside is quite a big issue, especially mm -hmm. for a lot of autistic people. And for us autistic people, we are extra prone to burnout because mm -hmm. it affects not just our energy and the traits that I mentioned earlier, the sort of feeling exhausted and cynical and everything being just so much harder than it, it usually is, but it also affects our ability to communicate mm. completely can, going non-verbal and it just makes it hard to take care of our basic needs. I think two things that contribute to us being very, very prone to that burnout is masking and sensory issues. Yeah, totally. I'm not sure if I should define masking. I don't know if it, how familiar with people are of it, with it as a term. Yeah, I, I th as? that's the thing is, is, is that's, it's not a very defined term, is it? I mean, you could say that it's, um, hiding your autistic traits or social camouflaging. Um, the specifics of it tend to vary, very greatly from person to person. Mm, definitely. I find in myself that it can either be conscious or subconscious. Mm. I often find myself thinking, even though I'm very open about being autistic, I will sometimes think, okay, these are new people. Let's not flap our hands. Yes. But then a few minutes later, I can feel the pressure in my chest start to build when the lights are too bright and I can feel my head getting foggy. Mm. And at that point, I generally sort of slap my head or self over the head with a newspaper and be like, Vera, just, just chill. It's fine. You can move your hands about to, to stop the, stop this uh, feeling of, pain from the lights just be open about being autistic it's fine nobody nobody mm. is going to care at all and generally they never do but masking can also be not just subconscious but also conscious uh, not just masking can be not just conscious but also very subconscious where if you've spent your entire life trying to fit in and appear normal and copying people's behaviors then it's going to take a lot of effort and yes. all, all masking just takes so much energy. Yeah. I, um, I talked to, uh, creator Paul McAuliffe from, from autism from the inside when we we're talking about, um, sort of the differences between the ways that the autistic people sort of go about, um, things like socializing and small things and, I, I really um, empathize with it a lot because when I was younger, I I used to be extremely confused about um, how neurotypicals would just kind of go about and do things without like contemplating and thinking over and having a reason to do it. Um, and it, it, it makes, makes sense because we, we do have two modes of being. One is that kind of unconscious, like going with your gut kind of emotionally base decisions and behaviors and then you also have the the more higher co cognitive as aspects of analyzing and like you know something something that's really sort of key to be being a human um and a lot of autistic people we don't use that sort of lower emotional brain to do things and so mm. we end up expending a lot of energy for things that other people might not expend hardly anything like Good example is, you know, you decided to go out for a run today and you're going to start running every day for a week, <laughs> let's say. Um, that's going to be much harder than, than uh, you know, if you've been running for a year and it's just part of your routine. It's like, 
you don't have to think about it so much and you don't have to prepare yourself so much because it's like a, a set habit, a set routine that you have to just go out and do. Um, and I feel like that, that transfers a lot into social situations as well. Mm. Like if you're thinking about social situations and masking to such a large extent, it's obviously going to cause you to be a lot more taxed and tie in the aspects of having like a lower social battery it just it just sets you up for getting completely overwhelmed by very short situations. Do you do social scripts? Um, I I don't because my um, working memory in social situations is not very good. Mm. <laughs> that's it. No, that's interesting because recently, as my working memory has been improving with time, uh, I'm not depressed anymore. Does wonders yes, for you. That helps. <laughs> yeah, who knew? Uh, I've been using it more because, but but in a sort of, it they help me make fewer decisions in life in yes. my daily social communication. Mm-hmm. At work, I've got these little notepads on my screen, different colours for different topics, and they're just filled with blank sentences to fill in. So some sort of yes. sentences like. Thank you for reaching out. Um, I currently cannot do this because blah, blah, blah. And then there's like a pick list for me. It just helps automate all of that. And I feel like they're social scripts, but they just help reduce the amount of energy I've got. I can definitely see myself using that kind of thing, like especially through like emails and social media. It's like I've only just realized that you you can have um, saved replies on Instagram. Yes. Or you can just you can just send like a reply that you it will pick up if someone's asking you a similar question to what the other person asked, and you can mm-hmm. save that. And then the next time that a question like that comes up, you can just click the button. I exactly. haven't started using it yet, but I'm excited to building it up a little bit more. All this automation makes so much sense, right? But then if a neurotypical person comes along and sees all my notes, they're yeah. just why? They feel like a psychopath also. <laughs> they, they, they just think, hey, um, how do you manage to, to use all this? Isn't that a lot more effort? But for me, it's actually less effort mm. to have that all prepared. Mm. What you were talking about there, the, the fancy biological word for that is habituation. That's the word from animal behavior science, ethology, that describes how animals, we're animals as well, get used to stimuli in their surroundings. So every time a plane goes by generally animals will look up and see what the plane is see what the noise is where the noise is coming mm-hmm. from and eventually they'll just learn to tune it out whereas yeah. us autistic people we, we don't have that habituation effect we, we don't know how to do that we will always be looking at at what the sound is my fridge my mortal enemy in in the room yeah. behind me i can get a little bit it. of a buzz it's unplugged today good I'll put it back on later uh, when I'm upstairs, <laughs> but we just don't have that habituation, which yeah. brings me nicely onto sensory issues. The other thing which I feel causes autistic burnout, because we don't have that habituation, we can't ignore sensory issues. If you're forcing yourself to withstand painful environments purely because you think everyone else can do this, then that's going to have a massive negative effect. Hmm. Schools workplaces just going on public transport all of that is really really hard and i think there's there's something that that i was talking to um uh, natasha from uh, i want to tell you books um she does like uh, neurodivergent um neurodivergent affirming parenting and we were talking about how weird it is that teachers and parents think that like it's it's a bad thing to like offer autistic children sensory supports because they have to expose them to it. You know, they you know, they're not gonna have that in in the real life. You know, mm-hmm. they're not gonna be able to use the headphones and the shades and things like that. And I'm like, really? Because I use them all the time. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't impact my day from from using those sensory supports. No. I was very worried about starting to wear noise cancellers and sunglasses in public because for some reason and I've had this my whole life I attract the odd people on public (laughs) transport I generally go out and sit and do some drawings of some interesting landscapes or any interesting buildings and people come up and chat to me 
I don't know why, it's just my vibe. And I was kind of worried that I'd lose that because it's a really wonderful way to bring a little bit of joy into my world and meet people who I never would usually. So I was concerned about it, but actually nobody cares, especially the, those people who come up just for a chat whilst you're drawing. They don't mind you wearing sunglasses and noise cancelled at all. And at work, nobody notices. In the workplace, they, you're, you're, you've got the Equality Act. You're allowed to, to, to wear whatever you need to help. And so it's just... That's just odd to me, especially because it is backed by scientific evidence. Habituation, we we literally cannot learn to deal with the stimuli. Yeah. It is insane. I think one I, I very much I'm very much happy with the noise cancelling aspect of things. I think the only reason why I don't wear shades is because I don't know, I, f I feel like I feel like people can very easily paint a picture of me if I'm, you know, I'm a tall man and I have a beard at that point and I'm wearing sunglasses. It's kind of like a bit of a stereotype for like mm. those, those <laughs> like Fair alpha enough. male red pill people. And I, that's, that's, I just can't get around it. Cause you know, if <laughs> yeah, fair. I'm I always like self-conscious about, about wearing them. <laughs> Especially because you're autistic and then if you, they make that assumption and you start having a shutdown and a meltdown or start losing your ability to communicate or you need help from them oh, because yeah. it's an invisible disability you might need that extra support in a public area and they've got a bit of prejudice against you that would go mm. against you and so I completely that's, understand why you made that choice that's that's exa exactly why it's um it's kind of one of the you know, among the 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 large list of positive things, you know, it is definitely a negative to me to me going to the gym so often as well because it's um it's almost like people are less likely to think that I'm capable of struggling and having a negative experiences, whether it's men or women. It just tends to be the case that you know, if I if I dress my 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 very goffy as my very goffy self and you know, I look like I go to the gym. It's it's like I come up and um say that I'm struggling. It's almost like people just kind of double take and they don't really don't really go into like caring mode. Yeah. It doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, it's 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 a bit hard. Mm, I completely, I feel that. Well, um, I think there's you know perhaps another aspect to autistic burnout that I wanted to touch on and I can't remember it right at this moment because it's gone um as it does I think another aspect of um aspect of autistic burnout that might be um quite in quite important I think um is is stuff around um sleep as well because you know uh, reading reading some of like the research behind like think the circadian rhythms and like melatonin and stuff it does seem that you know fr from statistics and from talking to people that a lot of autistic people struggle with the sleeping aspect of things um struggling to get off to sleep not having very high quality sleep um not being able to wake up as as easily and sort of get straight into um life mm. um and i know that sometimes if that happens and you kind of you have a plan for the day and you kind of wake up late it's it's kind of like you're always running behind and you're kind of stressed out and then it gets to the evening and you've got stuff from the previous day that you need to do on the next day um i know that's something that can be quite a, a vicious cycle and i think as well you know a large part of us um performing well being being well is aspects to do with diet um, and hydration, which is something that, again, I feel like a lot of autistic people str struggle with keeping on top due to things like interoception. Um, like it's, it's such a massive, massive part of like your bl blood sugar levels and, um, how that impacts your well-being. I think it's, it's quite a big contributor to that. You know, if you're very stressed and you're very hyper focused throughout the day, you might forget to drink as much water as you should do. Um, that can impact your sort of mental well being. Um, same with food. I think it's um, 
that there those be I, I suppose these are more kind of indirect um sort of additive things to the experience um i found it really i found it re was really helpful with anything to do with um stuff to do with your mood and stuff to do with your like productivity and overall well-being um understanding things from like a, a neuro chemical or hormonal sort of set point is really important i did a podcast not a podcast i did a post about um trigger stacking in in dogs um and how that um i feel like it can help explain a lot of the experiences that autistic people have uh, when we have meltdowns and, and shutdowns and things like that um it's it's kind of going off the principle that it's the same in humans um cortisol is released when you experience like a stressor and then um but the the cortisol it doesn't just like rise up and then die down really quickly it can i think the half life of it is like an hour two hours something like that so it, it sticks around for quite a while after the events um and so if you go through your day and you sort of as you said constantly bombarded by sensory social things things of that nature um that cortisol builds up and then mm -hmm. you get to a point where something very little happens like you can't find your keys to your house and you know it's just buried down at the bottom of your bag and so you shut the bag to the side and you you get overwhelmed and you have a difficult time with that whereas usually you would just be like okay my bags my keys are going to be in there somewhere i'm going to check that and mm -hmm. um so i think that that really um has helped me to be more aware of sort of the the small daily things that that would cause me stress and how how that would impacts whether i need to relax or whether i can work and such in sort of the evening well it's very interesting that you've mentioned cortisol there and previously a few sentences ago you mentioned how difficult it is to get going in the morning hmm. so exactly as you're saying wake stuff mm -hmm. exactly as you were saying that that cortisol for us is spiked by when we experience something stressful and like we were discussing before with the habituation, we struggle with not becoming calm. With mm -hmm. we, we just can't ignore these constant stresses, whereas neurotypicals can. The fridge, they just tune it out. A calendar change, they've had it a thousand times before. For us, it's still a stressful thing every single time. And so our cortisol will be spiked every single time. And stronger than most as well. And then if you combine those factors together... You are, you've got a situation where a person has very high cortisol all the time and it is going to cause exactly what we're talking about today, burnout. Mm -hmm. It's mentioned in the book that I recommended, the, the How to Calm Your Mind. If you enjoy the chemical and science understanding of things, it's not neurodivergent specific, but it's still a really well-written science book. There he talks about how burnout is you losing the ability to create the stress hormone just because you've had it so high the whole time. You and get like, mm -hmm. uh, what's the opposite of oversensitized? Um, desensitized, like you just... Desensitized. Mm -hmm, you just don't respond to it as much anymore. And in the mornings, cortisol and adrenaline and all of these stress hormones is what gets you up and out of bed. And if we're just not responding to them anymore, you're going to physically struggle getting out of your bed. So it's literally chemically not your fault yeah i think that there is a tendency I, I think that i've seen a lot of people to separate out psychology from physical things like i think people forget sometimes that your brain is an actual organ mm -hmm. that it does it is impacted physically by things um you know yeah. i i feel try, trying to you know, a lot of the ways that I feel like I've been able to understand my mental health conditions and things like burnout a lot more is by actually looking at, you know, what are the physical things that are happening at the moment? Because it kind of keeps you a bit more grounded. You can be like, hmm, cortisol is very high. Got a little bit of adrenaline coming through because there's a deadline coming. Right. How do I deal with this? Rather than, you know, sort of 
staying very in the moment and uh, and obsessed and like hurrying and and like playing into the adrenaline and the cortisol and it's just not very very good um and i think it's it kind of goes back to the reason why we have these systems because it's originally used as you said for wake sleep um sometimes a bit to do with appetite um sometimes to do with um avoiding dangerous things and having like the energy to do things but our modern day although our stresses are a lot less sort of life threatening they're still they're still important to us and they happen chronically like over a long period of time it's not like you're going about your day chilling and then the line pops up and you have to run away from it it's oh, there's this deadline and there's that thing. And then I've got this thing that I have to reorganize for that thing. And there's there's these things and there's some papers that have come through and I need to read those letters. And then, I, oh my God, yeah. this the fridge is broken. It's making a horrible buzzing noise. <laughs> there's so many things that we should do, that we could do, that we might do. And that know, choice, this... isn't it? What is mm-hmm. it, that choice? Um... Paralysis choice process yeah and there's so many of these things that we should be doing we that either we think that ourselves or we have been told that this is important to somebody else and expectations expectations are very high and i don't know if it's just me and my black and white thinking but i am very very hard on myself for for those reasons because if somebody's told me this is important to them can i help I put myself into it 100% even if I don't necessarily have the energy. And that's not because I don't recognise I don't have the energy. I know I'm tired. But I'm really... Oh, the dog's barking. Sorry. Foxy. Yes, somebody closed the car door. He just runs halfway down the stairs and stares at me. Cortisol's going. Adrenaline spike. <laughs> there you go. And now he's thing is, dog then just goes back upstairs to sleep, whereas I just yeah, that's my still on it cardio. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Anyway, <laughs> well, um, I realised that we we talked a lot about burnout and things like that um for a long time. Uh, so it might possibly be good to um. I don't know. Would you would you be able to go through sort of your own experience with with burnout and I guess look at looking back in hindsight and um, sort of listing off some kind of red flags mm. for what for what happened for you when when you're approaching a burnout? Sure. I knew that autistic burnout was applicable to me. The first thing when I finally managed to sit down and research autism. Mm-hmm. I did not know how to take breaks. I always overexerted myself and said yes to everything and really rarely had any kind of recharge time. At school, I was in quite a stressful environment and there was so much work to do. I was there for many, many hours a day and I was ill all the time. I was ill maybe for two weeks, then I'd be back in school for three weeks, then Same. I'd be ill for two weeks. This was diagnosed as psychosomatic. And it was really, it was, it was, but, but it was to the point where they thought I had tuberculosis because it, I had such bad illness, but it was always psychosomatic, but never investigated further. Yeah. Then going into that, uni, sorry. So it, it tends to be something that a lot of women get labeled with, um, like things like BPD and borderline and it's like all these, all these other things, everything but autism. And this, the psychosomatic component is literally just like you think something and therefore you feel it and it happens. Yeah. It's um, it's very funny to me, retrospectively, because you can either laugh or you can cry. So <laughs> you might as well laugh, right? Then going into uni, I struggled massively with my mental health and was only able to work for about three and a half day of hours per day. Yeah. Tops. The only thing that really helped was was being outside. So I did a lot of volunteering and through that I met some awesome people and started to learn how to talk about mental health through them. And I'm so grateful 
for all the vocabulary they introduced me to. Once I recognised what chronic burnout was, it was one of the main reasons I pursued getting my diagnosis because I just wanted a reason for why my brain and body felt so disconnected. Mm. The brain and body, it's all connected. It's all one thing. It's not separate. And so I figured there must be some sort of reason behind this and I wanted to figure out why my energy levels were so spiky why when when I was interested in something and it was amazing I felt like I could live and breathe and eat just that thing I was interested in but like Mr Robot just like type of coding for hours and hours and (laughs) making my gardening plans yes thinking thinking about advocacy just ah making spreadsheets just having a great time but um yeah so it all made sense after that and I've really been working on understanding my needs, my capability and capacity. Capability and capacity, they're two different words. Capability is, oh, do you know how to bake a cupcake? And capacity is, how big is your oven? Yeah. So those are really important distinctions because I was capable of doing all the work that I wanted to do, but I did not have capacity. And so understanding that distinction was was really, really important for me and ultimately enabled me to join in the workplace. I'm able to work full time, which is a massive privilege and something that gives me so much joy. But I'm still sort of, I've still been teetering on the edge of that burnout and it's something that I want to put a stop to. I've generally just confused being driven with overworking. And that's a strong, strong no. Overworking... There's such a societal trend towards that at the moment, though. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's almost like it's glorified. Like, um, and I think it's it's really important, you know, when you were talking about like capacity, um, you know, you you could, you could probably stuff a lot of cookie dough or I don't know, what what would you say? Muffin, muffin dough into, yeah, cupcake, cupcake dough into the oven and just absolutely ram it full and come out with this, this huge, minecraft-esque blob of cupcake but that doesn't mean that it's a good cupcake no um like you... and, and you can't eat that much cupcake for all the love in the world <laughs> i love cupcakes there's not that many that i want to eat after a while they're all going to start tasting bland can you see where i'm going with this metaphor yeah, yeah. the lack of joy from overworking creates is is palpable yeah i don't know it's i definitely agree that there is a societal trend toward this and i completely blindly accepted it Hmm. despite the fact that in my current workplace I've got awesome workplace adjustments I've got a really supportive and calm working environment but I was always chasing the dopamine I always wanted to do a bit more here a bit more there whatever made me feel helpful or whatever I felt was valuable but if you combine that with all the external stuff that happens outside of work Recently for me, it's been pretty for long. The last year has been difficult. I've, yeah. Yeah. There's been lots it's it's of weird, isn't it? Like in, in the mornings when you're getting ready for like a work day, it's like for some reason, like you see perhaps your battery, I don't know, 90% because you had a bad night's sleep or something. And so you're like, oh, cool. I've got 90% of energy to use. You use that entire amount of energy for for your working day and you're like oh i'm on five percent you know i've got to get home and then something happens and then you forget that you've got a social event and then it's like mm-hmm. you you don't have the energy to do that kind of stuff and you have to spend more energy for like reorganizing things and so it's kind of yeah. like you just run your battery completely battery, battery free without giving you any like wiggle room and that battery, if you've got that 5%, I was neglecting to realise that I still need some battery to recover. I still need battery to clean up my house. I need to make myself dinner. Even something like going for a walk is going to take some of that battery, and I need that. Mm. And so I came to this this breakthrough, which was very helpful, in the words of Taylor Swift, hi, it's me, I'm the problem, it's me. Yeah. Because I recognise that I am making those choices of running my battery dry and struggling to recognise when I need to rest. I was overdoing activities like the rest. I'd go into the forest, I'd be there for half an hour and feel amazing. 
So I continued walking for another hour and a half until it was dark. And then I realized I'm in the middle of a forest with my dog. <laughs> I don't have a flashlight. I don't have dinner waiting for me at home. Trying I... to min-max resting. <laughs> yeah. And I also don't have any groceries. So obviously that's going to be a problem. And that's where I needed to genuinely reevaluate my relationship to my energy and my capability and capacity properly. Hey up, just popping on to say thank you for listening to this podcast this far. If you could do me a real solid, please make sure to rate the podcast if you're on a podcasting streaming service and do all that like, subscribe, comment stuff on YouTube. Damn, even send a heart in the comments if you don't feel like typing. Make sure to check out my link tree, which is always down below in the description, or head over to my Instagram page at Thomas Henley UK for daily blogs, podcast updates, and weekly lives. This podcast is sponsored by my favorite noise cancelling, noise reducing earbuds that you can adjust the volume on. Really, really great thing. They're called D-Buds, and you can find the affiliate link down in the description of this podcast for a 15% off discount. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. That's all from me. I think there was something that you were saying about, um, you know, your, your school time, sort of having three weeks of doing loads and then having two weeks where you're sick. I think that's that's been... It was really interesting because the, the previous podcast, um, it's not come out yet because I've been burnt out and so behind on things. Um, <laughs> ironic. Yeah, ironic for the, the topic of the podcast. I'm not, I'm not totally on top of it yet, but I'm trying. Um, but I, we were talking about how very much my my experience of life is like a roller coaster. I have like peaks which are like really great and I'm doing so much. And then I have absolute just tail off drops where I, where I just, you know, I, I can't function and I need supports and things like that. And I think that's a really good analogy for like what happens when you just lean into that, that whole burnout thing, mm. you just get so overexcited with the amount of energy that you've got and just burn for it all and then not give yourself enough and, things start to fall apart and then you you have a you I have love, a, a burnout. I love the analogy of a roller coaster because that is so true to my own experience. And I'm I'm just sick of it. I don't want to be going up and down anymore. I'm just mm. tired. I'm so tired and I know that I need to be here for a long time and a good time. And that's part of my recovery journey has been slowing down even though I really don't want to because I love I love all the things that I do. Hard but relate. it's necessary. <laughs> and my goal for 2023 has been to have a boring year because I just I just need to slow down and figure things out. And I've been setting myself up for success and learning what all my different red flags are for approaching approaching mm. that burnout. And it's been incredibly invaluable. And what what would those sort of red flags be for you? It's difficult because alexithymia, alexithymia, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. My favourite topic, everyone knows it. I mention it every 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 episode that I can. <laughs> you, you need to get yourself a bingo card for, for listeners. Yeah, yeah, put like a little counter in there. How many times has Thomas mentioned alexithymia? <laughs> alexithymia, there you go. So alexithymia, with, with my difficulty in identifying and describing my feelings, I've got a little emotions wheel on my phone it's helpful but it's not going to do the trick right so I've had to adapt everything to fit that and so yeah. I I have red flags for burnout which are my behavior or my or my social behavior or my energy and those are much easier to to recognize than feelings you get feedback don't you mm, exactly so the, the small behaviour changes include things like not singing, eating less, neglecting chores before because they just don't seem worth it. Or a big mm. one for me are ticks. They're very hard yes. to, to ignore. My my neck just goes back, you know? I get I get little ones. It's mostly from like the, the sides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Sometimes I get them with my arms, but... Oh. Although they, I... Mm-hmm. I hardly have any when I'm not anxious, but... If I start getting anxious, then I get little ones. Um, if I have, like, a meltdown or something, they get, like, really intense. Yes. Same for me. And I used to really struggle with tics. I used to also have a speech impediment. I absolutely hated it. But I've grown to love them because they're there to help me. They're there to protect me. They're there. They're literally my body telling me... Babes, slow down, please. We're yeah. overstimulated. So, <laughs> you know, we, we work together. Yeah. Mm, socially, I really become obsessed with any errors I might have made. I reread emails and messages a lot anyway. I've trying, been trying to get a handle on them, but it can escalate to like rereading an email to a colleague 30 times. I withdraw and isolate myself. I lose my words. And interestingly, this is something that a friend of mine mentioned that, that, that she experiences, and I definitely do the same. I help people more. When I'm going into that crisis mode of, okay, there's a lot of problems going on here, I start helping others rather than stopping to, and helping myself first, which mm. is interesting. So you like switching your focus onto someone else because that's like... It's, uh, I, you know what, I, actually, I, I relate to that. Mm-hmm. The worse that I'm doing, the more likely I am to like offer up my energy and my time for people who are struggling too. I don't know yeah. if that's just, I think that might be just a, 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 the empathy aspect of it. Because you kind of, you feel it a lot more because it's something that you're, you're experiencing. Not, not perhaps for the same reason or at the same level, but you are experiencing something similar so you're like oh man i really feel this and you just want to take care of people make sure they're all right (laughs) maybe i don't know why it is but it's definitely a thing and it's odd especially because i know that the general feelings that accompany my the 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 road to burnout for me are Mm. forgetting what makes me happy and feeling meaningless but just being overwhelmed more easily and getting more meltdowns and I, and I know that if I ignore all the behaviours that I mentioned earlier and these general feelings, it can all escalate into physical illness. I will once again get that psychosomatic illness of the weird cough that comes from nowhere that I mentioned that I had a lot as a child. But I get cold sores on my lips and on my fingers sometimes as well, which is generally just being more... Signs of low, low immune system because mm. it does anxiety and cortisol and things like that they do affect your your body yeah. in a lot of different ways definitely and so these are those are my red flags i have a list and i try and keep it fairly updated and then whenever a few of those flags are raised at the same time that's when i know okay it's time to to go and do something about this and have a little meeting with myself and figure out where do we go from here it's really helpful because it's a good quantifier of i think don't worry about it don't worry if you're going into burnout until you've reached this this Mm. point i'd like to mention a resource which is super helpful before you go out and make a list of burnout indicators it's called know your normal it's a resource we made with ambitious about autism you can find it on their website and it's a great way for you to figure out what your baseline is of when do i usually go to bed how many hours do i sleep who are the people i hang out with What are my Mm. favourite interests, my favourite foods? Everything that's your normal life. It's a very accessible resource and really fun to fill in because that way you've then got a resource that you can utilise your natural strength and pattern recognition and figure out when you've deviated from your normal and spot when things are going wrong so much easier. I think... um... A good red flag for me in terms of burnout is a lot to do with transition times. Um, you know, so for, for a lot of autistic people, it can take us a bit longer to switch. It's it's kind of, it's been a bit, it's a, a bit funny, like, um, talking to some parents about it, because it's like, they, they feel like it's something that would only be an issue when you're going in to do something that you don't want to do. Like uh, these these transition times, like it's, for example, it's it's not necessarily 
I need a long transition time to go from rest to work. It's the opposite way as well. It's like, it takes me a while to get out of work mode and get into rest mode. But, but in terms of burnout, I mean, for me, it's, it's the case that, um, I'll have periods of time where I just completely ignore all transition times throughout the day. So I just won't give myself any, any rest or breathing time in between things. It could be like as little, a little as going down and getting a glass of water. Um, you know, that, that tends to become a lot harder for me to do, to like break things up in that way. And, um, not just jump from task to task. Like it happens when I'm approaching a burnout. Yes. Um, and then I also have the opposite side where my transition times sometimes just take forever for, for ages. You know, I finish the day at work and I really want to go to the gym, but for some reason I've been sat on my bed for two hours. Um, just, you know, I want to move. I just can't. I'm just kind of yeah. locked, locked into um, the environment that I'm in and not, not able to kind of transition, um, both from, from rest to work, but also from, um, work to rest to sleep, you know? So all of those things that kind of compiling over each other and because I'm setting myself such a high workload during that time, cause I am approaching a burnout, um, I get behind on stuff and then it kind of builds up and the transition times get longer and longer and then you know I just find myself unable to cope with things and Mm. I also give myself more to do when I feel like I'm approaching that burnout I don't think it's because I want to feel busy and distract myself I genuinely just think it's because in that moment where you feel like you're drowning all the small issues feel insurmountable and so everything has this sense of urgency because everything is equally bad, everything is equally mm. hard, everything is equally terrifying, and that's because it's all 100% awful. Yeah, just reaching the, the top of your limits. Mm. Whereas usually you'd have, not when, when you're not drowning, you'd have much calmer processing, you'd have all the executive function skills that you need, and you'd be able to assess, okay, this task is low Prioritization. Priority. This task has high priority, but I'm going to find it difficult, so I'm going to ask a friend for help. This task is important for my well-being, so I'm going to do it now. That sort of thing. But Mm. because we're drowning, you're just clutching at all the straws, trying to do everything at once, and clearly that's going to make things worse. Which is interesting. Uh, The same friend who mentioned the um, cupcake... I'm going to start that sentence again. (laughs) A friend of mine pointed out that when she's going into burnout, she also feels the same way around everything being really urgent and trying to do all the things. And it's sort of because she finds it easier to just get into the burnout and recover from there rather than stop. And that surprised me because, well, we'd not really talked about it before. I think this whole burnout, it's... It's a massive mental health topic, but still not really talked about. And so, especially if we don't have those mechanisms for de-escalation, that mm. how we don't have that empathy for ourselves and we don't stop and just reduce pressure on ourselves, then it's going to be really tempting to just push yourself into burnout because then you're physically incapable of doing more. And so it feels like less effort to recover. When actually, what we need to do when we're feeling like we're drowning, we just need to take a deep breath, hold it, and float up to the surface and pause. But same like a drowning person, they're going to be thrashing their arms around when actually what they need to do is just put their arms underwater and just breathe. But that takes practice and is terrifying because it doesn't feel like like it's the right right thing to do. do. Yeah. I think that that's really important that you mention that because... You know, the, me- the the mechanism behind cortisol and adrenaline is that it's used to give you energy and to drive you forward to problem solve and to get out of a stressful situation. And as I said, like, might be good in a very simple situation where your life's in danger. Sounds sounds a bit weird me saying that, but in it chronically in, in such a complex world that we live in, 
it, it doesn't doesn't do us any favors because it does kind of feel like I, I really empathize with what you were saying about your friend because it's the same for me. It's like once that adrenaline courses all builds up um, around something like perhaps you're trying to edit something and you finished it and you've got a deadline in a bit, but the program isn't working. And so you start opening up loads of different other programs to try and figure out why the program's not working and you restart it. And so you, you halt the program being able to, <laughs> to work and you just get, keep restarting it and you keep trying to do stuff. But really what you need to do is probably just leave it for a bit and come back later, even mm -hmm. though you want to do it. Um, but I think it very much when you're in the midst of that, those cortisol and adrenaline spikes, everything in your mind and your body is telling you to work on it and to try and get it sorted so that you can relax. Mm -hmm. When, as you said, sometimes it's a lot of the time when you're in those situations, it's good to step back because although it gives you more energy and it makes you more focused, it also impedes, like impacts your cognitive function. Mm. your ability to think clearly and think over stuff slowly and problem solve like is needed for those complex tasks yeah stepping back taking a breath can feel really illogical so there's no shame in it whatsoever that, that people continue doing it and there's no shame in burnout will stop really mm. it takes me about an hour two hours sometimes like stepping back from something that first hour is always the hardest because I feel like everything could be solved by me completing this task. Brute force. Um, That's brute what forcing I call it. it. Brute force yeah. problem solving. Yes, it feels great. Exhausting. Yeah. And not always the best option. <laughs> no. I do. So I guess we, we've talked about sort of your and my own personal experience with autistic burnout and some of like the red flags and what the difference is between like um normal burnout and autistic burnout normal burnout um neurotypical so yeah neurotypical burnout um so i i guess you know a question on a lot of people's minds is you know how do you know if it is burnout or something else because a lot of the symptoms and feelings and and level of functioning that you have during a burnout might be quite similar to things like depression hmm. with all the things that we've talked about and all the feelings it it's always going to vary for everyone right people are unique and every neurodivergent person is different that being said we do have a similar shared experience and so if any of these symptoms sort of speak to you and as autistic people we do tend to research autism yes. quite a lot so I, i'm imagining this is one in the many of resources that people are visiting if they're interested in, in the topic as to your question about the difference between depression and anxiety it doesn't necessarily have to be one just because they go hand in hand yes what what does make burnout different is looking at those causes of the 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 energy looking at the different parts of your life and depression might be a part of that unless it's long-term clinical de depression but they are yeah. very very similar and anxiety at least for me is just a normal part of everyday life and it definitely definitely contributes to those causes of burnout massively it's it's such a drain on my energy every day yeah yeah, I think that's that's another thing that we perhaps missed out when we're talking about like the contributors to burnout because mental health is very very common, isn't it, for for autistic people, especially that those anxiety related things. Mm. I think, you know, I I, th I think for me, the the important distinguishing factor is that it's situational when it's burnout. Like, there's different causes of being depressed. Like as you were saying. There's the psychological angle of things. Um, there's things to do with like your neurochemicals. Um, there's sometimes existential, like philosophical reasons for becoming depressed. And then there's also the situational aspects, which I think a lot of people who say that they've been depressed before um, 
have experienced, you know, some stuff related to work, stuff related to life, things breaking down, um, causing you to, to, to jump into sort of a period of time where you're depressed. Now, for someone like me, perhaps, it's a lot more psychological and neurochemical. You know, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. It's it's something that I've lived with, lived with for 13 years. It's not something that's brought on specifically by my circumstances, although it can it can contribute sometimes to burnout, sort of in the long run and my sort of tolerance for things. Um, so I definitely say the situational aspect is important to to know. Like looking back on the time before you got into depression or a burnout, um, has there actually been like a cascading building up effect of um, anxiety or, or poor mental health over a long Absolutely. period of time absolutely and because i didn't have a mechanism to release all of that energy or find ways to stop myself getting into the burnout then it was was getting worse i suppose as well you know there's that whole thing about depression you have that cat- catastrophizing learn um what's it called learn helplessness with depression you know if you're feeling very much that you can't control this and you just seem to be going down and down it you know obviously leads to a lot of feelings of learnt helplessness which kind of lend to that experience of depression mm. either either way with with all of this it's important not to make any assumptions about what it may or may not be and not to panic because either if it's through my own choices of i have chosen to overwork because i wanted to I have chosen to not to yeah. overdo my rest or I have chosen whatever, if it's my choices or if it's external factors. There's so many things going on in our lives that we just can't control. And a lot of them are really awful. So if it's that or if it's genuinely genetic, like it is in so many people with all three of those. Apportioning blame to it isn't going to help. Yeah. And so much like we were talking about earlier about taking the time to step away and breathe for a second, you've got to do that again. You just take a minute to stop and think of all the things on your mind which are making you overwhelmed, just looking at all the things that are going on, whether that's any tasks or responsibilities, but also your environment. Because if you're in an environment that is not conducive to you being autistic, where you're being shame for any of your traits or mm. you're being forced to mask a lot more yeah the sensory elements of it are difficult then that is all going to make make you feel awful so it's important just to stop and assess your situation and it it doesn't matter if if it's because of autistic burnout if it doesn't matter if it's because of depression or it's still going to help stopping you won't you won't make a mistake by stopping yeah I think that that's that's really important, and although it can be useful to kind of go through and look at some like resource and stuff, it could just be as simple as getting your notes page out and thinking about all the things that you're worried about and things that you have responsibilities for, and just kind of seeing it like laid out, and just mm-hmm. thinking, is this something that I would give to someone that I love <laughs> to do? Something that that would be conducive to them having a a good time? Absolutely. I make a list of stresses and everything, absolutely everything from the clothes that I'm wearing. Currently, one of my socks is a bit funky. And <laughs> oh boy, I we got had a the break. seams too. Uh, yeah. Too much of an inseam. I took my, uh, we had a break earlier, so I, I, I took them off and everything's fine now. But, but anything from socks to big picture, thinking about work, uncertainty can be a big deal for us. So writing all of that out, that's recommended in the the How to Calm Your Mind book. And there the author was saying that about two thirds of these are generally external. Yes. However, for me, I found that overwhelmingly all of my stresses were internal. Mm-hmm. They were caused generally by me putting a lot of pressure on myself, me not scheduling in breaks, my own high values and the way that I expect myself to behave I wouldn't expect other people to behave in the same way of, of like, 
not making mistakes. You, you literally can't not make mistakes. Mm. Mm. So all of that, it was it was a real eye opener, really, about the way how how I treat myself. And like you said, I wouldn't really give that list to do to another person. Yeah, even if you thought they were incredibly competent, it's mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of stuff yeah. to deal with. Um, I guess what one of one of the good things to perhaps go on to is like. What about the, like the preventative strategies? Whether you are, you know, why building up to a burnout? It sounds like it's an accomplishment. Whether you're building yourself up to a burnout, <laughs> or you are actually within a burnout, yes. what kind of um, sort of strategies or or thinking or like um, lenses do you, or framing tools do you use to? Um, help yourself in those situations yeah I look at that list of stresses that I've got and think about ways in which I can reduce them every little helps and the more you can reduce it now the less severe the burnout's going to be I found it really easy especially at the start of my journey in terms of treating myself like I was physically ill if I had the cold I would not be forcing myself to sit at a computer for eight hours a day yeah yeah I might need to take some sick days. I know that being outside helps for me. Excusing myself from social occasions is a big one. Just because I think I should yes. doesn't matter at all. I need to recover. I wouldn't go there if I had a cold, would I? No. And, and declining unimportant meetings. These are all sort of small, quick wins, which will all depend on your situation and what is on your stress list. But... There's an analogy that I use that's really helpful in terms of thinking about the big picture and just taking a step back. It's the three-legged stool. It's basically the way that you can imagine your life as a stool, so it's sort of this, this, the little mm-hmm. chair with three legs. And everybody's going to have different legs and they might change throughout your life, but they generally tend to stay quite stable. For me, one of mine is nature. Another one is art. That's where I do all my happy autistic lady illustrations. And then finally, the last one is friends and family. If you've got a stool with uh, three legs and one of them breaks or is a bit wobbly, you can still continue sitting on the stool, but it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a real workout for your abs. And you won't be able to do it. You're trying to stabilize yourself on a... Exactly. You can figure doing like wall sets and stuff like you had in PE. <laughs> Ooh, the, the burn. You'll feel the burn. Your body will start shaking. It's not going to be great. If your stool suddenly has two legs that are broken, you're going to fall off. Three, you're completely on the ground, shattered. Thinking about what your legs are can be a little bit daunting, but it is imperative for me for understanding why I'm feeling wobbly. In the past, my legs were, one of them was education, so it was my school stuff. One of them was sport. I did a lot of frisbee. And then one of Mm. them was sort of nature, all all my advocacy work, all my nature work, all my autism work, everything. And you'll notice part of those wasn't a friend and family leg. They They were integrated into all three of those legs, which meant that I was only ever spending time with my friends or family if we were working together on one of those things. Mm. That was made overworking so much easier it also meant that when I had an injury in frisbee I suddenly lost almost all of my social life and made me feel really really awful or if my education wasn't going really well we had some cell biology modules which I absolutely hated oh microbes no thank you so that then made my entire... That's so what I did my degree in. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. How? My condolences and admiration at the same time? Imm- immunology, parasitology. Wow. I did that, to be honest. It was, it was very um, to do with human cells. Yes. So it's more about the interaction of human cells with the microbes. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I'm an oncology girl, and I like to think about the big things. But part of that is I did loads of climate change modules and I was doing a lot of climate change advocacy. And so Mm. that's all a bit much. And I continued doing it because I was very passionate about it. 
and that's where all my friends were so I didn't feel like I had a choice even though I really did so thinking about how I needed to rearrange my stool really really helped so that I've got friends and family separate and we still do things separate to the other two legs so there you go trying to think about what my my legs would be I think there's there's always been through through my life kind of I guess yeah, probably about three three different pillars of things that I do. Mm-hmm. I think you know one of them is definitely YouTube, <laughs> just watching YouTube videos or, or playing a mobile game or something. One of them's tends to be work related, like um, I don't know uh, my online stuff, my um, my part time job, things like that. They tend to be another pillar and then the last pillar is like some kind of sport or exercise like yourself um i guess you know it i definitely i i do need to figure out more ways of enjoying life um i think it's just it's one of the things it's kind of you know as i was saying too earlier about like you know quite often well, not quite often, but for, for myself, um, a big part of my depression diagnosis is that I'm very ap- apathetic. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but um, I don't really experience emotions as easily. Like, mm-hmm. it, anyways, just thinking about the alexithymia, you know, obviously that's a big impact, but also like SSRIs and medications that I'm on, you know, the mm. SSRIs, they don't just boost your mood all around, they just flatten you out. Um, and so it's, it's very hard for me to notice and value a lot of things that aren't related to productivity. Yes. It's definitely something that I need to work on a lot more, but I know, I know the reason for why, for why I'm doing that. That's the way we're raised to be, right? It's the system that makes us that way. And we'll get on to how I've changed my success evaluation in in a little bit Mm, i'm sure but it's uh it's just easier it's just easier to think about how much you've achieved rather than quality so it's it's difficult but um from my own experience of what what you were saying with the legs it sounds like you've got quite a lot of different components within each of the legs Mm. i did that as well for many many years and i just thought oh i can just grow more legs i can do four or five different types of things when in reality I need to task switch between each of those, right? If yes. I want to do five things, it means I've got to divide my time up between five things, which means I need to switch between tasks multiple times. And get those transitions. Mm-hmm. And those transitions aren't easy for me. They take a lot of spoons, each of them. So just practically speaking, I'm a big fan of maths. You can't maths out the fact that you're doing a lot <laughs> more transitions. That's just not going to add up, isn't it? Um. And so, yeah, having a think about where where the community lies and where you're getting the most value from. And, yeah, so if we've done stop, we've thought about why. The next bit really is accepting that I have I struggle with transitions. I accept that I am neurologically sensitive. And I accept that I have a lot of differences to the way it should be and I I'm quite happy that way I don't want to be neurotypical I'm very happy the way I am Mm -hmm. obviously there's there's drawbacks but it's it's, I'm instead I'd much rather go down the route of accepting where I'm at working with myself not against myself just taking a moment to say well done me for recognizing that I'm struggling yeah because even though I think that's that's a big that's a that's a big thing for a lot of autistic people. Those neurotypical expectations that we have about where you should be in a certain number of years and what age you're supposed to do what, and you know, like it could be as simple as something like having a car and, and using a car. Like that that's such a big thing for a lot of people. Like, <laughs> um. You know, you should be should be independent. You should be able to to go places your own and stuff around food, perhaps. You know, instead of buying individual ingredients for food, you know, sometimes you don't always have the energy to 
to do that. Yes. Like little little things that make you individual and, and different and have different needs from other people. Mm -hmm. But recognizing that stuff and also contrasting it with your skills and the positive things that come from you having a different brain. Yeah. Addressing that internalized ableism is a lifelong journey and I accept that. And where I'm at now is that I'm trying to take my own struggles seriously and accepting my needs and behaviors as an autistic person. It's been really validating to prepare for this podcast and talk to my friends about burnout because it's not something that's talked about very much. Turns out two of the five or six people that I talk to are currently in burnout. Mm. And we were just talking about all the different ways in which their experience is similar to mine. And it's been so validating to hear that I'm not alone. That's really what Happy Autistic Lady is about and what I set out to do, that you're not alone. There's a whole wide world of autistic people out there and we all can learn from each other and find out ways to recover from each other as well. It's been lovely to do that. I think, um, I suppose a good, good, you know, the, the just going off when you were talking about sort of the differences between burnout and autistic burnout at the start of the podcast, we were talking about uh, the sensory aspects um, in particular. Um, I don't think a lot of people, especially if they've just recently been diagnosed um, or people who have their own sort of internalized ableism or, or stigmas or stereotypes around um, various things, like there's this, you can get so much relief and so much, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily real, a real big thing. It could be as simple as getting some earbuds or getting some some noise cancelling or listen to more music or um, wearing shades, uh, adjusting your environment so that you've got nice orange coloured lights instead of white lights. And um, there's, there's so many little things that you can kind of do, especially like within your own living space that really help. Mm -hmm. And also when you're out and about, like, do you really need to, if you, if you find jeans extremely difficult to wear, do you really need to wear jeans a lot? Um, unless you're going out on a night out and some clubs won't let you in because you don't have jeans on. But... <laughs> I can't go to clubs. I've given up on them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a crochet lady myself. Anyhow, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely. Reducing sensory stimuli is a big part of my recovery plan. I just need to give myself the space to be without any of those sensory issues or masking. So all the things that you mentioned there, wearing the comfy clothes, but also things like eating safe foods. Mm. I've got a list because during burnout, I will forget what food I've liked. I like it's on the inside of my fridge because the outside has uh, my illustrations. So the inside, like it's frozen. You just, you just, you just, every time I open the fridge, there's a list of the food that I can always eat and it's always in my pantry because otherwise I will forget. Yeah. So that, that that kind of consistency with foods that aren't too mm. overwhelming, I think that's important. My, mine at the moment tend to be like these protein pudding yogurts and um, protein pancakes that are just store bought. You just microwave and very nice. <laughs> and little things like that, you know, because I think that I, I do have a tendency to gravitate towards the sugary things, and sometimes. If I'm not feeling able to prepare myself food um, or I don't have anything to prepare, sometimes just having a real big stock of these foods that yeah. I know that I can eat and they're not too bad for me. I'm a big uh, proponent of smash, instant mashed potato. Some people, it's a Marmite situation. Some people hate it, some people love it, but it's 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 always there for me, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, anything just to reduce the sensory stimuli, I know that I probably won't be able to deal with crunching this, so... Smoosh it is. No, that's not the word. Mash. Mash it is. Mash, yeah. Yeah. Smoosh. <laughs> I think that there's a lot there's a lot of other things that you can you can think of that I think because it's a very individual thing, it can be hard for some people who are just getting into it. And it's really good you know, I have a podcast which is um bit a bit far back where I talked to I want I want to tell you books, Natasha. Um, 
about sort of sensory environments and sensory supports. And within that, we were, um, we gave a lot, lot of lists of different things that you can try. And there's also a part of that kind of sensory sphere. There is the stimming, you know, because for a lot of us, we get stimming kind of lent out of us. Um, just free life and the experiences that we have, or perhaps from parenting or teachers. Um, and so finding stims that really that are really good for you, that, that help you regulate a lot, it can be really good. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be those kind of stereotypical stims. You know, for me, the biggest stim that I do is go to the gym because it's a vestibular, it's proprioceptive. Um, I get to listen to music, so it's it's auditory as well. Um, and it's, it, it's also part, part of my routine and it, it makes me feel good after and helps me sleep and stuff. So, you know, I would classify that as a stim. Definitely. Um, it's there can also, be lots of things like that. It's also something that brings you joy. And so it's as part of recovery, it's really important to think about what gives you joy and where are you getting relaxation? And is it really relaxation or is it just something that other people find relaxing that, mm. I'm taking a bath. Mm -hmm. It's weird. <laughs> it's also sense like things like loads of people enjoy running. I can't get into it because <laughs> for me it's so overwhelming. I can run on in, in the gym on a treadmill, but if I'm running outside, even though I love being outside, I just get so much information. It it, it really tires me out. Mm, totally. So you have to really find time for that recharge. And find those ways of making things easier and meaningful for you. I think that was definitely just going to be a lifelong journey, especially as my needs evolve, as I try new things, as my special special interests change. You know, it's a joy, a fleeting thing. Yes, yes. A good way to think about the joy is making a happy list. So something that my sister taught me, and I really recommend, is making a a page of all the recovery activities that you can do all the happy things that you have in your life divided up by energy yeah. and i've got that right next to my bed so that if i'm in bed and i'm doing scrolling instagram because that's the only thing that i've got energy for and we all know how addictive instagram reels are then i can just look up and i can see the three three categories of energy for for happy times that's a good idea it's definitely something that I'm going to think about implementing. Yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting that you talked about sort of divvying up energy because there's quite a common an analogy theory people have and stuff around like spoons. Um, it's not something that I've really used a lot myself. Um, I think it's more just that I kind of, over time I've kind of intuitively understood how much energy I have to spend in the day. So I I have a bit more awareness around it. So I, I've never really used it myself, but I know that mm. it's helpful for some people. I use Spoon Theory a lot. I learned about it through its Wikipedia page, surprisingly. It's got a great Wikipedia page. Thank you to whoever wrote <laughs> that. It's it's basically exactly like your battery, your percentages that you we were talking about earlier. And it's just thinking about oh, how much energy will it cost me to do a certain task? So you would think, oh, this is going to cost me 5% of my battery. This is going to cost me two spoons. It's equivalent. Rather than just thinking about time and how much time you've got to fit things mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like maybe your battery analogy works a bit better because you can understand that, oh, today my phone is draining very quickly. Yes. You know? it's. I, I think as well, I mean... I definitely, I don't know. I, I think I implement a lot of things while I'm doing things that require energy that help me mitigate it. Like, um, like I'll have some like sensory lights on my desks and now and again, I'll just kind of play with them. And I've got music that I listen to that, that calms me down. I've got like this really tough chewing gum that I can use if my, if I get, need some oral motor stimulation. Um, and if I, if I'm a bit bored, I can kind of look out the window and just see what's happening outside. So it's, it's, I, I suppose at the same time as 
giving rest, which is something that I need to work on. I think you can you can also do a lot to reduce the impacts of like things that that don't need to be an issue. Mm-hmm. Like if you're in the workplace in an open plan office, you know it's not just the fact that you've got to spend spoons on doing the piece of work, but it's also the the sensory, the unpredictable social environment and meetings and you know things that are not necessarily part yes. of the plan but just are there. Yeah, so one bullet point that definitely falls under the recovery is reducing commitments. And it can can be awful saying no to meetings if you've not ever put yourself first. Yeah. Believe me, I've been there. But reducing commitments is essential so that you can then avoid those spikes in energy use, especially if they're unexpected. Now, I've sat down with quite a few of my friends over the years so that we can actually make a spreadsheet to decide how to reduce commitments because we all love doing things, don't we? We're just very passionate (laughs) about so many things and it's just amazing to do stuff and it hurts to say no and step back. So we always just sat down and made a list of all things that they do and then a column to rank them about how important they are to us. Hmm. And they can be important in different ways. They can be an important part of your social life. They can be financially important. For example, going to work is important financially yeah. for me. Hmm. But it's also important socially for me, and I do feel like I'm contributing. So that's where I'm really, really privileged to be able to do that. So it would be very high up my keep list, obviously. Whereas other things like going to my neighbourhood litter pick cleanup day is going to be nice to see people but I don't know a lot of them I don't know what the weather's going to be like I don't know what the route is there's a lot of uncertainty and so that would be very likely to be removed from my to-do list and just saying no I found it really hard to learn to say no so I literally have a list of ways in which to say no (laughs) use it all the way Thank you for thinking this of me. This indirect message of uh, indirect methods of saying no to things. <laughs> I try and be I try and be fairly clear, just because I want other people to do the same to me, because I don't pick up social cues at all. And so it's generally around the, the sort of format of "Thank you for thinking of me." I am currently unable to do this Thing. another day, or generally, no, thank you, not today. No, goodbye. All, all sorts of that, those those phrases, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I, uh, I'm definitely, I'm definitely with you with the, um, the directness. I, I kind of, I stopped doing it because I, I got really obsessed with neurotypicals for a lot. But it's, it's part of the reason why I started to learn more about autism because I was just so fascinated with people. Mm. Um, and um, so, so I started to learn about it, and then I was kind of like trying to be kind of like translating and 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 trying to fit into other people's way of communicating and being um and i have done that in in some cases with people Mm. but i think there's you know as i'm sort of getting older i'm kind of trying as much as i can to shift the communication style towards something that i agree with more which is that that kind of directness and you know mm. um just highlighting to people that it doesn't mean that I'm you know I, I'm literally just saying the same thing just straight to the point rather than going about it all Love. weird and fluffing it up yeah um and that's the same with a lot of other areas of my life it's you know I feel more confident in kind of advocating for how how I like to have relationships and to communicate and things and there's some places where I compromise, but I think in general, you know, it's it's sometimes good to mm. stick to stick to what feels good. Especially if you're burnt out, you don't really have a choice. I mean, you, you like you do have a choice to continue it, but it's much easier to be authentic to yourself and ask people to meet you there. Obviously, it's difficult when doesn't go the way you were expecting so if you ask for help and then 
it doesn't doesn't go the way you would have liked but it's quite rare that that happens and also yeah. we just have to learn to ask for help it's something that i was focusing on for the last two or three years where a i struggled to identify that i needed help but then b asking for help was really hard and it's imperative to recovery because it's not my fault that i got into the situation that i'm in life was just too overwhelming and it's not a it's not a nothing about me it's just the way life is i'm in, in a rut it's not a personality trait no it's not that you you just aren't capable of dealing exactly. with life it's exactly. just you need to shift it towards a way that's more conducive to you yes. having a good life and so being with people in that recovery phase can really help without masking in a non-transactional way with no expectations that's that's all that's needed and asking for help is important because that's what friends are for, right? I help so many people, but really, really struggle to reach out. So I've got a few ways in which I have learned to do that. One of them is something that a study mentor at uni taught me. There's do, delegate, dump or delay for every task. You can either do mm. the task, but I'm burnt out. I, I, I can't do anything. Yeah. You can delegate it so you can ask somebody else to do it for you. Or if it's something like cooking can delegate that to a professional or instead of chopping the onion you can bought buy pre-chopped frozen onion yes yeah dump just don't do it or delay it until if it's actually important and doesn't need to be done it can be delayed so those four things were my initial step into asking for help the delegation thinking about the tasks that i can be helped with thinking then, less so it's less like internal like emotionally internal it's like i need help it's like no i'm just delegating a task <laughs> exactly it's efficient it's business-like i can do this yes yeah and, and that's that's a really important distinction between the types of help is emotional and practical so asking for emotional help is really difficult and you should mm. really only be doing it with people you genuinely uh, genuinely trust but the practical help can can be a massive burden off your shoulders as well things like if you're stressed about a presentation doing practical responses will be things like making a script rehearsing your slides or somebody researching for you that mm. sort of thing yeah okay. um recently i had an experience where i asked a really good friend for emotional support because i'd been helping them with emotional support for a few months and it went wrong and it ended up making me feel worse. And it yes. revealed to me how one-sided that relationship was, which obviously hurt so badly. But surprisingly, this has persuaded me to reach out for help more often and earlier on in those friendships. Because so it, it, it sounds odd, but it's a good way for me to determine how much I should trust others. It's boundaries, isn't it, as well? Like you know having boundaries about how much energy you, emotional energy you spend on someone is equally important yeah um and i think as well i've been in situations like that as well i think some people just kind of get used to you giving them everything and then when you stop doing they're like oh hey what did i do what did what was wrong with me like why are you not why are you not helping me why are you asking me for help like it doesn't make sense to them they kind of forget that you're human mm -hmm. sometimes and that you you also have difficulties especially if you're supporting them that's why professional help is really helpful um, but unfortunately that's just not available to everybody although if you have any sort of opportunity to, to get regular interactions with a with a professional then it really helps understand yourself better and unpick everything going on in, in in your head you can be a lot more selfish as well and feel okay about it yeah like in terms of what you're talking who you're talking about and definitely you know what's what's bothering you is the topic of the conversation yeah kind of thing because there's so much going on in our lives right and for me it's all these small things in in how i learning how to treat myself as an autistic person learning how to work with myself rather than against myself in daily everyday life but then also dealing with big picture things i've moved country in the last year i've moved, changed wow. job I, I 
entered into the workforce and then dealing with saying no to all the other stuff I was doing previously. It's it's just a lot to, to process. Plus, you've got all the external factors that inevitably everybody is going to have to, to, to deal with in their lives, either that's family or friends or something unexpected. Like a few years ago, there was a global pandemic. You know, that was quite mm. a lot to handle. So there's it's good to get a professional's help to unpick with everything and, and learn those healthy coping mechanisms because you can't magic them up out of the air. And so that's, it's an integral part of setting yourself up for success. So for success, for me, it's sustainability. I want to recognize who I am and what my needs are without mm-hmm. any attitude towards that, with joy and kindness. And I want to accept who I am and I want to build a life for myself and to be able to deal with all the crappy things that happen every day. So a big part of that was thinking about how I measure success. I used to do it quantitatively because that's easier, right? How many hours have I studied? How many lines of code did I write? How many books did I read? How many website visits and social media followers? And (laughs) There's so many ways of measuring it quantitatively and it makes it really easy, but more is not sustainable. It's also comparative as well, isn't it? It's dependent on other people, which we know, as we were talking about expectations, it's not, doesn't work like that in reality. No. So the alternative to that is quality and thinking about the quality of things you're doing. Connection is a really big one for me. Thinking about enough and balance. So for my three-legged stool in my friends and family I try and schedule in time to connect with people sure with nature I try and think about what's a small thing I can do that will immediately I will be able to see an effect of that on one other person that can mean going into the forest with someone just for a little bit coming back it can mean just tidying up the yard in the local park or whatever and in with my art there's no such thing as art enough or quality. It's just doing it, just being purely is, is enough. And so calendaring in time for all of these things and thinking about quality rather than quantity is such a big shift. And I'm still in the middle of all that. So it's something that I'm learning to do and thinking about what I care about and just, just in a way being strict with myself. Refocusing. Yeah, being strict with myself and stopping when, when I feel like I need to. Brilliant. Awesome. Well, uh, we've been talking for a while. I think it might be good to kind of wrap things up. Um, It's been really lovely to talk to you, Vera. Uh, I'm just wondering, did I tell you about the song of the day aspect of things? Or is that something that I glossed? Song of the day, yeah. What's that? Um, (laughs) Usually I ask my guests, which I haven't been doing, but usually I ask my guests to... Um, think of a song which um, <gasps> means something to you or something related to the podcast or I've got one okay wait I You've need to one. find okay. what it's called though okay it's called Vienna Vienna uh, and it's ooh, it's literally about slow down you're doing fine by Billy Joel yes cool nice awesome well that uh song vienna from billy joel will be down in the um playlist song of the day playlist that you can always find right at the bottom of the description um i think what 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 i want to do as as well as that is you know i know that you do um, a lot of online related things um so if my listeners kind of listen to this and they want to check out more of your stuff where would be the best place to go to we are on instagram happy autistic lady but we've also got a website where we've got a few free resources including talking about burnout and uh, so please do follow us on on instagram it's great to have people join the community and it's just a nice way for documenting everything i've learned since starting happy autistic lady and sharing ideas and ways of being awesome brilliant And if you have enjoyed this podcast thus far, please make sure to give it a rate if you are on any of the kind of podcast streaming services, Apple, 
podcasts, Google, Spotify, whatever. Really, really does help. And also give it a like if you're ever on YouTube. Consider subscribing for weekly podcast episodes all about autism and neurodiversity. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can always find my link um, links down in the in the description. You can find my email on there. It's like a little icon at the top. Um, and if you want to check out my website, see all the, the stuff that I offer, check out the consultancy and coaching, that kind of thing, uh, that is also in the link tree down below under all my links. Um, and yeah, lastly, social media at Thomas Henry UK. Come follow me on Instagram, see what I'm up to on the daily. Check out the daily blogs that I do over on Instagram. And um, yeah, I guess one, uh, one of the last things I want to ask is, uh, have you enjoyed your 40, 40 experience, Vera? I really have. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a really good prompt for me to think about all of the work I've done on this topic in the last many, many years. And how that's all developed and how much it developed with my understanding of the fact that I am autistic. It's also given me a great opportunity to reach out to friends and talk about it more. And if that's taught me anything, you're not alone. Brilliant. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this episode too. Uh, thank you very much to Vera and um, hope you all have a good day. I'll see you in another episode next week on the 40 Auti podcast. See you later, guys. Don't start.